Every so often I like to take a look at a car that did stuff, or didn't do stuff as the case might be. And some people really like the deep dives into cars because there might be stuff going on behind the scenes that we never saw at the time, or there's stuff that's only just recently come to light as the designers do interviews, or those who know more than us do their own journalistic delves through the history books. These types of videos are usually quite few and far between. Over the years I've done the FW19, which was Williams' last title winning car, the Ferrari from 1992 considered the worst Ferrari ever but then there was the 1980 season. I've also done the twin chassis Lotus, the Brabham fan car, the front wheel drive Nissan, and accidentally upset people by saying that the Mazda 787B wasn't banned for being too loud, or too fast, or any other performance related myths that you might have read on the internet. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. So for this video there might be a little bit more myth busting because of the driver involved who was driving this specific car and that kind of elevates the legend a little bit further. It might go even further still because of the car and driver that this car and driver, if you follow me, were up against. So today I've got the story of the McLaren MP48. 1992, let's be honest, was Williams' year. McLaren had won the last four years on the trot, Senna winning in 88, Prost in 89, and then Senna again in 1990 and 1991. McLaren and Honda had a cracking partnership, an alliance of the driver in Senna, the design team of the likes of Neil Oatley, Gordon Murray and others, and the power of dreams that was Honda. But in 1992, Patrick Head, Adrian Newey, Paddy Lowe and the other lads in Oxfordshire had designed and built a car that was... Well, out of this world, traction control, active suspension, automatic gearboxes, the Williams FW14B was nothing Formula 1 had ever seen before, and everything on it was 100% legal. It also helped that the engine had 30 horsepower on everybody else, meaning that when it wasn't out cornering everybody else on track, it was out dragging everybody else on track. The car was so good that despite the intention to not run it for the whole season, they did, allowing for development of the FW15C to carry on in the background. Despite Williams' dominance, McLaren still took some wins. Senna won at Monaco, Hungary and Italy, and Berger won the rounds in Canada and Australia. The only other non-Williams or McLaren win that year was the Michael in Spa. Were any of Senna's wins on merit? Well, Hungary was probably the only one of the three. I say that because at Monaco, Mansell had a loose wheel nut which caused him to pit and that put him behind Senna and was then unable to pass because, well, Monaco. At Monza, Mansell retired with gearbox issues and Patrese lost the lead through hydraulic problems, so Hungary is probably the one where Senna beat the other two Williams cars through being faster, because Mansell was doing his best to lose that race that day. Mansell was going to be gone in 1993, he'd gone to the United States to race in the kart series, and Williams was upgrading the FW14B to make it the FW15C, which was now going to be driven by two brand new drivers, because Patrese had gone as well. Meanwhile, McLaren at their factory was looking at what Williams was doing and thinking, yeah, we can do that, until some pieces of paper arrived in Ron Dennis's office. Towards the end of 1992, Honda told McLaren it was leaving Formula One. This was bad. The new MP48 was pretty much completed and Senna was doing his best to get a move to Williams sorted, which really kicked off in earnest when Mansell announced his retirement from Formula 1 at the Italian Grand Prix. At some point between then and the end of the season, Frank Williams signed Alain Prost as Mansell's replacement and Alain had a strict no Senna clause in his contract, at least for one year. So Senna, now without a Williams drive in what was shaping up to be one of the greatest cars ever built, and now appearing to be stuck at McLaren that was losing its Hondas, it was a case of, what do I have to do to win another championship? As mentioned, the Renault was the engine to have. Estimates put the power output at a minimum of 750 horsepower, while Benetton's Ford V8 was putting out around 720-ish or something along those lines. McLaren's fallback option for 1993 was going to be Ford customer engines as Benetton had first dibs on the good stuff that Ford was offering, so McLaren would be running around 690 horsepower. But thankfully for McLaren, some rule changes would help them out versus Williams. The FIA had introduced some rule changes for the 1993 season that often go under the radar. The cars were going to be narrower, the 2150mm track was reduced to 2000mm and the tyres were going to be smaller too, which meant that all the teams were going to be working on new bits and pieces that some might not adapt to. Neil Oatley, who was the executive designer, and Matt Jeffries, who was also working for McLaren at the time, decided that they were going to do exactly what Williams had done. They were going to build their new car and absolutely stuff it to the brim with computers. 
This car went to testing at the end of the season and was equipped with a fully automatic gearbox, active suspension, two-way telemetry and traction control, with the gearbox able to be run in full auto mode or flappy paddle sequential. Senna liked the way the car handled but knew that the forward engine in the back was going to be down on power versus the Renaults and what Benetton had got, and this was all part of his contract with Ron to be paid $1 million. Per race. The McLaren suited Senna down to the ground, really. It was nimble and the active cars are fastest when the driver lobs them around a bit. Mansell, another aggressive driver, was able to get way more out of the 14B than Patrese could, and Prost, who had just joined Williams, couldn't get his head around the active cars either. In fact, it's very much possible that neither the McLaren nor the Williams were driven at their full potential through 1993. Henri Durand, the head aerodynamicist, had the difficult task of getting all the aero package together with all of these systems on board. Barge boards appeared on a McLaren for the first time and making the car as tightly packed as possible around all the computers, wiring looms, hydraulics and all of that stuff and then still get Senna and Andretti in the car was a challenge, but they got it done. Apparently there was only a 25mm gap between the top of the radiator and the side pod and they had to shove a wiring loom through that gap. Duran told Jeffries that the gap was 25mm, Jeffries was insistent that it be 30 Duran gave them 25 and then dents had to be put in the radiator to get the wiring loom through. But despite being underpowered, Senna wasn't that far off Prost in South Africa, it was like 0.088 or something along those lines, and he actually led the Grand Prix briefly before Prost figured everything out and then went off into the lead to take the victory. At Brazil, his home race, he won it in the wet, but Prost retired. But it's Donington Park where the car and driver's legend lives. Senna dropped down the order at the start and then came back through to lead by the end of the first lap. It's ranked as the best opening lap performance in history and is always in the top three of best wet weather performances of all times, usually along with Schumacher at Spain in 1996 in second and Stewart at the Nürburgring in 1968 at the top. Senna, who had this utterly insane ability to find grip where others couldn't, coupled with a car that was very nimble around the compact Donington Park circuit, with active suspension and traction control aiding him, went on to decimate the rest of the field. McLaren, who had just got all these gizmos on board their car, had managed to put one over on Williams who had at least 12 months experience under their belts. Patrick Head told Motorsport Magazine back in 2023, his win owed much to our incompetence. The rain was very heavy, resulting in water building up on the track, generally a few millimetres deep, but in places it was much deeper. Our active car maintained very low ride heights, just a few millimetres above the ground, and gained aerodynamic performance by this, but when the water was deeper than the ride height of the car, our drivers were surfing. Although we had the possibility of making ride height adjustments from the cockpit controls, I don't think we fully understood what was causing the problem for the drivers. I think Alan made 8 visits to the pits and Damon 7, coming in as they had no grip expecting that this was due to a problem with the tyres, but it was not. High and medium downforce circuits seemed to suit the car best given how nimble it was. Senna would win again at Monaco, which is the ultimate high downforce track, and would also win the Japanese and Australian Grand Prix. In fact, following the Monaco Grand Prix, Senna was actually ahead of Prost in the standings, which isn't bad considering that the engine was underpowered. Around the British Grand Prix, McLaren got access to the same engines that Benetton had, either because the contract exclusivity thing had run out with Benetton, or Ford wanted a McLaren to get up there and win the championship because McLaren was the best chance of Ford winning something. Either way, they finally got the same engines, so they got a little bit more power. Around the Portuguese Grand Prix, they did the Lambo V12 test, which is a video I've done I, I, I did it ages ago. It's somewhere in the archive. In total, it was five wins to Prost seven, with Hill winning three races and Schumacher just the one in the Benetton, but the difference in engine power was evident at places like Silverstone, Hockenheim and Spa. Then there were the retirements. Senna had an opportunity to claw back into Prost's lead at Hungary, but retired with throttle problems, a race where Prost had rear wing trouble and had to pit, putting him seven laps down, this being after he stalled on the formation lap and had to start from the back of the grid. Senna would also retire in Italy when he collided with Martin Brundle, which would have netted a points gain as Prost's Renault engine blew up a few laps from the end if Senna had finished. McLaren definitely had a driver that could make the difference, there's no doubt about that, but I still think 1993 is an odd season, where out of the two best cars on the grid, neither would have been driven to their full potential. The MP48, if it had more power, would have probably won Senna a fourth world championship. Likewise, if Prost had adapted to the Williams and its active systems better and was a more aggressive driver instead of a smooth one, the Williams would have been as dominant as it had been in 1992. When McLaren tested the McLambo later in the season, they realised the car would have been way more competitive and Senna thought the car would be as fast as the Williams. 
Ex-McLaren engineer Ian Wright reckons if they'd used the Lambo or something similar for the whole season, they would have won the championship comfortably. There's this thing online about how the car was an utter bag of bolts, when really, it was almost brilliant. It's not like it was last year's Aston versus last year's Red Bull. Like I said, neither of the two cars were run at their full potential, because one had two drivers that were too smooth, and one had the driver, but not the power. Aerodynamically, it was great. It had all the same computer aids on it that the Williams had, and it's thought that towards the end of the season, McLaren had a better active suspension system than the Williams did. I think some, um, well, we'll call it sand attacks might be involved. The legend of the driver creating some sort of Mandela effect or something like that. A teammate that didn't commute in from the United States for testing and races that year might have also helped McLaren out, but that's an episode for another day. I think you can see what I'm saying here. The FW15C being hailed as this ultimate god tier machine that was vastly superior to the rest of the grid, no questions asked. So any win by another driver is seen as being a massive achievement, when really, for reasons already explained, the gulf between the two cars wasn't that great after all. And while Senna's talent is something to factor in, it wasn't everything like some like to Claim? Is that the right word? I don't know. I'm sure someone can phrase it better in the comments. Even McLaren knew it was a good car. Everything I've read while putting this together has said the same thing, whether that's from McLaren engineers, Ron Dennis, or journalists that saw the car in person. They just needed some more oomph from somewhere. Imagine last year's Red Bull with 40-ish less horsepower. Aerodynamically, brilliant. Power? Eh, not so much but McLaren would have to wait until about 1998 to partner a good engine with a good car that was aerodynamically sound. Does that leave the door open for another car-related history session? Yes. Yes, it does. So then, a look at the misunderstood McLaren MP4-8 from 1993. If this has taught you something new or made you realise something, then do like the video so I know I did a good job. And for more stuff from this channel, subscribe and get the bell on so you never miss out on anything else I do around here. Massive thanks as ever to the rad lads at Patreon for the support, and if you want to help out with the picture purchasing piggy bank or otherwise keeping things running around here, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, affiliates, and other bits and bobs that you might want or need to know. Well, the super thanks and memberships if you want to do that. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.